Hey, and welcome to The Residence, a series of four podcasts exploring community in the creative sector, specifically focusing on the Pervasive Media Studio, a brilliant community of over 160 artists, creative companies, technologists, and academics, all exploring experience design and creative tech in and around Bristol. The Pervasive Media Studio is a collaboration between The Watershed, University of Bristol, and UE Bristol. We've all kindly decided to support this podcast, so shouts to them. For this series, we invited residents who you might consider to be people of difference to chat with us on Zoom about how they were coping with lockdown. But we've also thrown some moral dilemmas or quandaries their way, if you will, so stay tuned. In this episode, some of the younger residents chat about trying to establish themselves whilst managing the change in pace lockdown force. We also discover location services to be an unlikely hero. Here we are once again on another episode of The Residence, and I'm joined by Jasmine Thompson, away in Astors. Did I say that right? Um, eh, kind of, almost. Uh, if you're if you're English, we'll say Owen. If you're Welsh, we'll say Owen. Okay, so we have got Owen with us, and then we got Emma. What we like to say, young residents of the PM Studio, a freshman gang out here, and yeah, just here to chop it up. Really, uh, if you guys would like to introduce yourselves, that'd be great. I'm gonna start off with you, Emma. Yeah, cool. Um, I dabble in a few different things. I work with virtual reality, uh, helping set up the VR theatre on the hub side. Uh, I work in kind of interactive arts, like producing and making. So created some installations for libraries and then a lot of sort of community arts facilitating as well. Um, yeah, lots of dabbling. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jazz, if you want to go next. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Jazz. I'm a PM Studio resident and an illustrator and designer. Um, so I do a lot of murals, uh, live sketching, um, graphic novels, comics, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, kind of dabble in a few different areas as well. Thank you, Jazz. And then Owen, we got you, last but not least. Cool. Yes, I am also a PM Studio resident and I also dabble in a lot of things, as is the nature of PM Studio residents. Um, I am a filmmaker, photographer, describe myself as a visual activist, uh, but basically working with kind of visual mediums across, um, across community settings, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Active bunch. Yeah. That's boom. Actually speaking to that man, because, um, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but what I found from my experience is I had that thing that I wanted to lead with, but there's so many other things that I'm interested in that I've started to learn through the PM studio I can get work for. I know it was quite a peculiar experience for me, like trying to figure out which thing to lead with first. I was just wondering how you guys took that process of like adapting to trying to figure out what the right thing to do next step for the future was for you. Yeah, I think there, there was definitely a, a, a long period of like doing lots of little different things because it was like also because so much work was obviously cancelled uh, or postponed or whatever and there was a lot of space and so I was doing you know all of the online talks but I was kind of uh, looking a bit more into finding a route into tv and kind of factual tv and that kind of stuff um also you know having like late night phone calls with all those creatives and filmmakers that I'd finally reached out to um from all over the world that you're always too nervous or you don't find the time to do and then because they're also in lockdown they actually have the time to reply to you which they usually don't yeah really looking at all the different possibilities doing you know doing the, all the cliches of doing a bit more writing a little bit more storyboard drawing all of that kind of stuff but yeah I think it was definitely helpful in terms of that kind of it was a bit of like kind of clearing the head do you know what I mean because normally we're just so packed and we're so you've got to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and and you've just got no time to kind of reset a little bit and actually think about what your aspirations are like you say and what you're doing right now to kind of head towards that so it's, def- it's help- helpful in that sense, I think, definitely. And then work started to come back and we kind of went back to um, just being packed again. But I was I was grateful for that. Yeah, jump back straight into the rat race, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know that. <laughs> Man, it sounds like you were pretty productive over lockdown. <laughs> I, I think for me, it kind of, it took a long time to adjust because I'm really fortunate to kind of have a job that I was working three days a week, which I was able to be furloughed on. Going from running around in my job and my, like, with my theatre mates and then to, to nothing. It was a real shock and it took me a long time to adjust to not being creative in a way. I, like, I, couldn't, I didn't really have much capacity to be creative and I, I think I kicked myself a lot at the beginning for not 
be constantly doing creative stuff and taking, you know, making the most of the opportunity where you're, you've suddenly got lots of time, where you can go to projects that you've been maybe putting on the back burner for ages. But I think actually the thing that saved me was just going on massive bike rides. And I just spent a lot of my time doing that. And I think that was what got me through lockdown, like being really fortunate to be in a really nice household where we just spent most of our time cooking really nice things together, sitting in the garden and being outdoors, noticing nature as kind of stereotypical as it sounds. It, um, that's what I really valued over that time. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been quite a roller coaster, but definitely makes you reprioritize things and and see the value and beauty in in things that actually aren't necessarily work related or career related. Mm. Yeah, how about you, Jazz? Like, how how have you found setting boundaries for yourself in work and somewhat personally as well? How has that evolved for you in in lockdown? I think in terms of like, yeah, saying no to stuff and taking on work, I found you're constantly told you're going to struggle. So you're not ever taught how to say no to stuff. It's kind of embedded within you. It's like, well, I've got to say yes to everything because if I don't, I'm going to be a starving artist. Do you know what I mean? And then it kind of gets to a point where you've got so much on and it's like, I'm not actually a starving artist right now. I am a stressed artist right now. Like, why have I done this? But there's nothing wrong with saying no and identifying things that, yeah, like might not be the right job for you. And I've gotten better at identifying that and actually taking a step back and just saying no. So yeah, that's one thing which has been like a massive kind of, yeah, learning curve in general. Mm. What sounds like you guys have become really adept at, at in lockdown is setting up your own creative professional practice. With that comes loads of things, you know, it comes uh, comes notoriety, reputation. Do you, do you find yourselves at points taking some of these opportunities because you are young? Like, is it harder to say no because you know that or you might have the impression that you're still in the kind of like earlier stages of your career? Do you even think that way? Do you feel like you're established now in your practice? I would never see myself as established right now not for a long time <laughs> in especially in this kind of field where we I mean we've all said we dabble in lots of different things and uh, there's so many crossovers there's so many things I'm learning like all the time like with every new project you're learning a new skill like a, a new thing and and it's amazing to see how all those different things like connect and cross over it's amazing to see like the similarities between projects you've worked on which are completely different from each other in some aspects but actually the skills you've learned in one completely apply to this one and I had no idea what path I really was going on but I'm suddenly on a path and and that's actually got lots of different branches and there's not necessarily one direction and so I don't think I want to be established in one thing especially I think being younger sometimes does make you feel a little bit uh like I can't take up space or I don't really have the the knowledge or experience to do that I've actually been told before not to, uh, like, as kind of part of this rife list once, like, under a certain age, and uh, it's very hard to know whether to put that on a CV or, like, on a page because it states, obviously, your age. So th- those kinds of things are really interesting, I think. Like, <laughs> what, what do people think of when they actually learn how old you are? Do you know what? Listening to you say that has made me reflect on some parts of my career as well. <laughs> because I see you guys as peers, but when I see your work or when I le- learn how you practice or you guys like share little nuggets of information with me about like what projects you're working on, what's the word? I'm really impressed by it effectively because I'm like, oh my God, like these guys. I th- and I think we all have that as creatives and as young people like, to some extent, there's like, oh my God, everyone else has got their shit together. What the hell am I doing? Like, in terms of like any young artists, what would you say to them? Like, what what has your journey been to this point? Because mine's been pretty unconventional. I spent six years working in re- ten years. Let's not do that to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I spent I spent ten years working in retail, you know. But like the whole time, I was like picking up the kind of information that helped me design a career for myself and a lifestyle for myself where I can be working creatively. Some cats would be listening to this podcast and think, oh yeah, he's been a podcast host from day. But no, that's not the truth. Do you know what I'm saying? Do any of you guys have any stories like that? Like I could shine a light for someone else coming through after you. I think for me, I never, I didn't really have a plan um, or a direction. And I think 
being open to opportunities that arrive in really unexpected ways has massively helped me and not underestimating the power of making yourself known or like having the confidence to ask questions and show that you're passionate about something or that you're interested in something like my first break or like the first kind of step into kind of interactive was hearing a talk from my now boss and just kind of going up to her at the end and saying that's really interesting I never thought of virtual reality as a tool uh, in a more like theatrical sense and making that known to someone and then offering help like at that time I was literally working three different bar jobs like actually training to be a pizza oven chef at one point and then suddenly this kind of world of virtual reality was opened up to me um so I think not being scared to ask questions and show your interest and actually really speak to people and just having no shame in that sense like don't be embarrassed just be like I'm here I'm interested like speak to me whenever you want I think I think I'm a little different to be fair in the I mean definitely you know having that kind of curiosity and asking questions and definitely definitely being open to new experiences but in terms of having a plan I I, I do this thing where I do like the five-year test and the two-year test it's like where do I want to be in five years where do I want to be in two years and if what I'm doing now isn't actively building towards that then it's it's probably not the right thing to be doing you know it might be this little side thing that I get excited because this is the thing you know I always got, kind of get distracted and excited by uh side quests do you know what I mean and I had I had this big thing where I it was basically um running a small video production company and that's not what I wanted to be you know that was never in in, in the plans and I kind of did this thing where I looked for you know five years ahead two years ahead where do I want to be I you know I want to be making films and so that's where I, where I was like okay I'm gonna have to t- take a step back to this and I you know and I actually I, I shut the company down I, I decided to transition to being uh, self-employed as a as a, um, as a sole trader as a freelancer um, and I think that was the, definitely the, the the right decision, and it's definitely paid off for me now. Yeah, Jazz, what about you, man? Like, you've been working with some cultural institutions and organisations around, like, the city centre and so on and so forth. You've got murals up in the PM studio. That was, like, the aspired breadwinner, do you know what I'm saying? And you're, like you said earlier, you're full-time now, isn't it? But what, what about before that? What was happening for you before that? I guess before I wasn't doing as much stuff with organisations. Like, but then I've always kind of, done work with organization so that's kind of always really been there but like the mural thing was something which really like um opened up a lot of stuff and um kind of reminded me of what I want to be doing in a different way it wasn't until I did the ones at the Royal Shakespeare Company in Barbican where I was just like they were on they were activism pieces so they were around uh, revolution and change and um like the protesting and movements and stuff that have been happening in the last few years. And it was like, that kind of solidified. It was like, this is what I want to do. I want to like create work that asks people questions and causes people to question themselves and society as a whole in a place, which is like where they can't avoid it. So it like, I I do have those kind of set goals. Like I want to be um, taking up these spaces, these spaces or working with these places um, here. These are like the locations I want to be sort of thinking about putting myself in. But in terms of like that pathway, like I'm trying not to be too rigid with it and be open to opportunities still um, in that sense. Cause it's like, I think especially being freelance, it's so hard to know like what your next job is going to be or where it's going to go. Or, you know, I didn't want to be too like, I want to be in, Berlin by the time I'm 29 da 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 like I didn't want to be too rigid in that in case it was like well something might come up here and then like I didn't want to ever feel too thrown off or too flustered by it so I think just like keeping those goals in mind and keep working towards it but also being open to opportunities that might take me down a different route or open up new doors as well I, I've learned to just try and not be too set with my landmarks and especially like correlating that with like age as well because it's like I'm gonna be 27 like in like a few months and it's just like I'm starting to wig out about it so yeah like I think not having the stability when you're freelance you've got to like have some element of being open to uh, whatever happens I don't know if that even answered the question whatsoever like I have no idea if that was even the question I love that do you know do you know it's mad hearing you guys there's hearing you guys talk firstly yeah has given me so many questions and I'm I'm gutted at like how little time we have because I'm like yeah yeah give me more give me more give me more 
before I go into what I was going to say, yeah, to all of the listeners, when Jazz said she was turning 27 in a couple months, she put her hand on her head like she was bare <laughs> sad. And I, I felt so attacked. I was, I, was like, I, was like, I was like, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. Don't do that. Lucky this has not got video next to it as well, because everyone would have seen my reaction. <laughs> I honestly felt myself get so sad. It was oh, just man. like... Like trying to swallow the pill, like. <laughs> nah. Um, but it's fine. Don't don't do that to yourself. <laughs> it's fine. Honestly. We're still young people. We're still young people. It's all yeah, <laughs> in it. <laughs> Heart, young in the spirit and mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Age is just a number. Yeah, literally. yeah. That's the truth. That's the truth. I can't lie. Hearing other people reflect on how they got here and that there's no set way to make a career for yourself is really reassuring. You're listening to The Residents, a mini series of conversations recorded in lockdown with residents from the PM studio. Next up, we found out how these young minds would change things if they could. Welcome back, guys. Yeah, so we got the next part of our conversation, I suppose, and it's a game that uh, Joe and I devised. Five different categories, and each of you get to pick a category, and then we'll present you with like a moral dilemma or a quandary, so to speak, and see how you would go about changing the world if the power was in your hands. Jazz, I'm going to ask you to pick a number between one to three. Okay. Number one. Number one. (laughs) Self-nominate. Great. <laughs> that was a bold move, one. Yeah. When you're ready, I've chucked some categories in the chat. Okay. Society, arts, tech, economy, and health. Um, health. Um, all right, cool. So, therapy is now mandatory. Everyone has to have at least four sessions per year, and if they don't, there are large fines. How do you feel about this? Um, I mean, I personally wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, I think therapy is like really beneficial, like no matter who you are, what you've got going on, like there is something to gain from going to therapy and kind of having that space to just chat. Um, I mean, the mandatory part. Yeah, I I kind of feel okay about that, to be honest. I don't really know what else to say. (laughs) Is it wait? Is do you it, have to pay? Like, yeah, yeah, this is what I mean. Like, is it mandatory, but you have to pay like loads to go, or is it free? Because great. So let's, like, would let's say it is state funded. What kind of fine <laughs> would you put on it <laughs> to make sure people? Um, I don't know, like eighty quid. <laughs> oh, that's tight. That's no, tight. you wouldn't want to lose eighty quid. Yeah, you, yeah, you you definitely go along to. You go, you go yeah. in it. Yeah. That's like two hours of therapy, right? Yeah, yeah. literally. Shoot. Shoot. How would you how would you challenge the people who for whom eighty quid every three months they're just like meh, I'll do it. Do it on like an income basis. Mm-hmm. Like, like like if like if you're rich, you got a you you've got a high a tax therapy tax. Yeah, it's yeah. weird, though, isn't it? I, I completely agree. Therapy, I think, is such an amazing thing. I think for a lot of people, maybe who wouldn't necessarily have gone for therapy but might find it really useful, that would benefit. But there's something about making something mandatory that makes it suddenly really like, but I don't want to go. <laughs> but then if it was mandatory from birth, would it even be taboo? It would just be something which everyone did. Like, it wouldn't be like a weird thing to talk about because it's just something everyone does. But you, you say from birth, does that mean you've got like two-year-olds going into therapy? <laughs> 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 therapy, that's a two-year-old. But yeah, I don't know. I think if it was something which was completely normalised, if everyone was doing it, like, and it was normal then like would it even be like um kind of met with resistance that that was a that's a good question that's a good question mandatory therapy for two year olds all right sick owen if you want to pick a category uh let's go let's say society go for the big one all right all right so this this one i like this one you are now able to access information on potential partners internet service providers now provide a full browser history on users. It also means they can potentially access your history. Would you check it? Um, I'd like to think no. I already kind of do it. If if I get an email from somebody that's like, hey, you know, let's have a chat or let's meet up or collaborate or whatever, I will inevitably stalk their Insta, their Twitter, their LinkedIn, their website, like everything. Um, so I might browse it. I might browse it, but I don't think I'd I'd go in hard 
um, and just being like, oh, okay, let's fight. Okay, what is your fetish? Come on, let's you know. Like, <laughs> no, I think I'd just be like, yeah, okay, cool. Let's see, let's see, let's see what these, this person's up to. They're yeah. doing any, any cool shit. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the same. I, like ultimately, like with social media and everyone's like on online platforms. Ultimately, anyway, you can access so much of people's information and so much of their life. I don't know. Like that wouldn't be that much of a shift i think from what we do within society already it's like a it's like a little it's like a little crv check in it do you reckon it would have an effect on cancel culture um i don't know whether it would almost mitigate it maybe i'll tell you what would be interesting actually it would be interesting if it actually created a sort of system where there's a little bit more honesty i think that's something that i feel like is missing from uh well you know sort of cancel culture at the moment is people being able to open you know without kind of provocation or without being found out essentially own up to something and be like okay this this is something that happened in my past that i have to come to terms with and that i i don't agree with and that you know i would like to apologize for basically yeah and i think that would be interesting and then if there's a side to acceptance of that and of being like oh, okay no there is you know because that's what we lack at the moment with anything um is is any kind of ability for redemption for, for public you know um i think that our whole kind of perception of of that is is totally totally skewed it's interesting like thinking about online personas versus who we are, really are and actually how much you would gain a sense of that person just from seeing like internet history social media like like, like jazz was saying we already do it in terms of like people's lives are on display in the way that they want them to be displayed as they are anyway. Um, how much extra information could you actually tell about that person just from seeing a list of like data in a sense, um, compared to actually seeing around them as a person? I don't know, yeah, it's a weird one. Do you, do you guys have any examples of people who have had like a fall from grace? Because listening to this conversation, I'm directed towards the obsession we have with the rise and fall. Do you guys have any examples of someone who who uh, kind of had a fall from grace, but then you've seen or you've been interested in them enough to see how they grow out of that situation. I recently watched a documentary on Marion Jones, 100 meter sprinter. Uh, she won the Sydney Olympics. Um, and then she got discovered for being on this performance enhancing drug for years. She's effectively been wiped out of athletics history so none of her times were recorded all her medals were rescinded but she started this charity called take a break and the reason she started that charity was because there was a moment in the case where she was asked do you recognize this vial of like chemical and she lied and she said no so then that meant she was charged with like perjury her account of the experience is if i had had someone around me who wasn't so focused on my career and my PR and was thinking about me, they would have told me to take a moment in that second. She was just like, that's what she wants to provide for young people. It's not even athletes or anyone, anyone ha having situations, young people in life. And for me, that's incredibly admirable considering she's had her entire career wiped from the history books. Can I offer something though? Marion Jones, black woman, right? Lance Armstrong, and you're saying like her whole history basically was wiped out. Lance Armstrong, same, similar thing, you know, doping scandal, you know, got his medals rescinded, but he hasn't had his history wiped out at all. You know, he is very much, I think there's people that will still think of him as that, you know, that award-winning um, greatest ever cyclist that maybe don't even know about the scandal that came later. You know, so I think there's definitely something in terms of our societal bias in, in, in there, you know. Well, I think that's why there's actually like a lot of implications around the idea of cancelling and uh, just gives people so much power to just, like you say, wipe someone out for one thing. And I'm not saying that some of the things that some of the people have done are horrendous and they should rightly so it should be, you know, there should be consequences to that. But there's something about this like online online persona and like fame that like rises people up like you say to this level that they, they, they can fall so hard from um and that without seeing people that there's not a true good and you know there's never a good and a bad 
and that line is always hazy and people kind of sway from one to the other although there's like parts of both of those in people so i don't know yeah it's a it's a really tricky one that but yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's that's it it's like it's the diligence with which we do that do you know what i'm saying because there, there there's in these situations there is so much gray area which is why like i really appreciated what you the sentiment you were sharing about it might mitigate people's like presentation of themselves you get me and it also also speaks to something um has anyone here seen when they see us the dramatization of the central part five that story is a maza um what was it what was it you you was you were talking about jazz you were talking about the scene where he's looking for a job in it yeah like he's done his time so he's come out and um he's trying to get a job I don't know if it was his lawyer or someone. He's with, yeah, someone basically. And they're helping him fill out an application form. And um, they're just like, oh, if you could just tick all the boxes. Tick felon, sex offender, da-da-da. And, like, he was just like, I haven't done this. Like, ultimately saying, A, imagine, like, coming out of, like, that situation. Having not done what you've been punished for. Um, but having to, like, accept responsibility for it. But also, just because you've done your time doesn't mean you're not going to be punished the rest of your life. He is going to have to take that box for his whole life, even though he didn't do it. Like, he's not in jail anymore, but he is forever restricted on what he can do and where he can go and who he can be around. Essentially, the punishment doesn't stop when you leave jail. And it was like, that was like a really like, ooh, moment for me. When I like deep that, like properly, you know, because initially you want to be happy, you know, like it's, it's a great thing that they're out, like, but then ultimately it's also so conflicting because it's just like well they're still being victimized that's interesting it's so interesting because because you look at that situation and you're like so much so much could have been averted if they had access to the data we have access to yeah now. like even just like location services if they all had their location services on it would have been proven that they didn't do it because they would have all been apart do you know what i mean like something that simple in that crazy um Emma, I believe I believe it's you. It's your turn. Your turn to pick a Ooh. category. Uh, I I don't really mind. I mean, like maybe health or is it is that an interesting one? <laughs> Go on then. I'll t- I'll pick tech. All right. Food is becoming more and more scarce. Cultured meat produced by in vitro cell culture of animal cells is turning up on more and more menus. There's also a restaurant that allows you to use your own cells to create meat made from you. Could you eat yourself? What the fuck? That's a really weird question. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Oh no. I don't, um, I mean, I'm, I'm vegetarian and... <laughs> So this, for me, is extra weird. Um, I'd be fine with the whole, like, scientifically manufactured meat stuff. Like, uh, I'd be chilled eating, like, a burger that was grown in a lab. I mean, eating humans is just, like, on another level. But I don't know why that should be different. I think it is. I think it massively is. Because there's just something inherently wrong with, like, eating your own species. Like, I just, I think we'd turn into a very weird society more than we already are if we did that um i i got up to let the cat out because she was scratching and i came back and i missed the question <laughs> but this is all really really weird <laughs> it's weird, it's, weird. It's, it's something to do with like cells being used to develop like any meat that you want and it's would you eat it but but you can use human cells to develop human meat <laughs> no 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 way why would anyone do that it's not all right but food is scarce <laughs> food is scarce like yeah that's the point be it'd be dope you could have a little jasmine kiev <laughs> <laughs> i don't want a jasmine kiev a little jazz on orange <laughs> i don't want anyone else to have that either like that's yeah that's weird. I don't think I could like vegetarian or the, like before that. It would have to be like a last resort. Like I'm gonna like, there's nothing else to eat, and then it would be considered. It would still be. It would still. It wouldn't even be an immediate yes. It would still be something I'd have to deliberate with myself. Yeah, for sure. Think of the menu, though. Think of the menu. 
all of the names of like different dishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be the kind of dish, not the meat in the end. You'd be like a spag roll. <laughs> Is that what it would be? That like they'd humanize it by just like putting people's like today, today you are eating will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some literal food for thought being served. It goes without saying, I felt lucky that they didn't get me to answer that last question. Shouts to Jasmine, Emma and Owen for rolling through and chewing the fat with us. The Residence was produced, devised and written by Joe Kimba and myself, Will Taylor, who was also your host. And shouts to Javier Velastin for the music as well. And big, big, big love to our listeners. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Just type in Pervasive Media Studio and we should come up straight away. And tell your friends to rate us highly wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next time, innit?